I'm back with a new video. So much to cover now. We've got to talk about a German study about kids. We've got to talk about a tweet that Marty Macri put out there. I want to talk about testing a little bit, particularly travel and airports, and finally Trevor Noah and what got him into trouble. So let's go. Let's go through this lineup. Number one, the German study. There's a fascinating preprint out from Germany, and it does some things that... No other study has done to date, which is linking seroprevalence to the rock-hard outcome. So let me walk you through what this means. We have always wondered how severe SARS-CoV-2 is at different ages, particularly children. We know that children, of course, thank goodness, they're much less likely to suffer severe outcomes than older people. But what is that number, and how high is it, and how does it compare to the kinds of risks we accept on a daily basis? Does it vary based on kids with or without comorbidities? Well, finally, we have the study out of Germany. Now, many of the prior studies, what they did was they look at, you know, among all the kids who present to a hospital system who are known to a hospital system, what percent of those kids have uh, come in with co who come in with COVID have bad outcomes, such as require ICU level stays, or are hospitalized, or uh, even unfortunately pass away, or have MISC, or have myocarditis. That's one way to look at it. But what it misses is it misses the full denominator. The denominator, of course, is all the kids who happen to have SARS-CoV-2, many of whom might not have even recognized that they were having symptoms, and they weren't tested, and they didn't document that. The German study actually overcomes this, and I'm going to put a link to it below. It uses a seroprevalence estimate of the population to get a denominator. So this is the number of kids who probably had SARS-CoV-2 in the period of time. And the numerator, of course, are the number of kids who are hospitalized, who require ICU level stay, and unfortunately who pass away. And here's what they find. They separate the results based on kids with comorbidities who have medical problems and kids without that. Um, and I think this is really relevant, as I'm going to talk about in a second, but here's what they find. For healthy kids, the risk of going to the hospital is 51 per 100,000. This is assuming that the kids were infected with SARS-CoV-2. For healthy kids, the risk of going to the intensive care unit is 8 per 100,000. For healthy kids, the risk of death is 3 per million with no deaths reported in that age group of 5 to 11. There are just no deaths there for healthy kids. Kids 5 to 11 actually appear to have a lower risk of hospitalization than kids younger than 5 and adolescents 12 to 17. And I think this confirms what we've seen in multiple other data sets. Kids 5 to 11 who are healthy had a risk of going to the ICU of 2 in 100,000 and 0 of them died. And then another important fact from the German study, among kids who died of COVID-19, 38% were already on palliative or hospice care at the time, suggesting that they not only had comorbidities, but they had really severe comorbidities. And finally, MISC, or the Pediatric Multi-Inflammatory System Syndrome, was less common with the Delta variant. So what does all this mean? I think one thing people say is that... Um, you shouldn't separate children with comorbidities from those without comorbidities. But the truth is, from a medical standpoint, you need to. And actually, if you put them all together, you do a disservice to both groups. You will severely underestimate the risk of bad outcomes in the group of kids with comorbidities, kids with type 1 diabetes, for instance, kids who are severely overweight. You'll underestimate their risk if you bundle them with kids who are without comorbidities, who are healthy. And similarly, for kids who are healthy, you will overestimate their risk by bundling them with kids with comorbidities. Medicine has always used people's unique medical history and risk factors to make tailored recommendations to different groups of people. So a six-year-old boy who is healthy, non-obese, who has had COVID-19, of course you'll think of them differently than a 15-year-old boy who's never had COVID-19, who is obese and has type 1 diabetes. And that's not being discriminatory. In fact, that's good medicine. If you lump them all together to make some sort of sensationalistic statistic about death rates and about how there's no population that's immune from bad outcomes, you're doing a disservice to both kids, actually. The kid who's at high risk is actually at an even higher risk than you think. So I think it's a deep mistake. It's a fallacy. In fact, it's a talking point used by people who I don't think have thought about it too much that you cannot or that you shouldn't separate these groups. You should separate it. Doctors must always take into account all relevant clinical information when they make guidance and decisions for the person in front of them. So that 16-year-old with type 1 diabetes, um, perhaps poorly controlled, who is overweight, um, that's the person you're going to rush to the front of the line for the vaccination. The 16-year-old who had COVID-19, who is awaiting sort of a college scholarship for um, uh, an athletic activity, that's the person that ostensibly could go behind. That's okay. That's good medicine. In fact, that's, that's a sound medical principle there. So the German study, I think, is sensational in that it is actually showing you the risks to kids 5 to 11 who are healthy. They are 
very, very low. And this means several things. One, it means that closing schools for that age group um, was a catastrophic error. That is an error perhaps one of the greatest policy errors of this pandemic, it will have long-term and damning consequences for the future of these children, for their whole lives, for their livelihood, for their life expectancy, uh, for everything. The people who participated in that error, I think, have made a grievous mistake. They owe us an apology. They were aided and abetted by the media, which refused steadfastly to provide a balanced perspective on that issue and succumbed to the fear-mongering. Um, the teachers' unions, I don't know why, but they got dragged into it. Um, they clearly put forth policies that made it very difficult, if not impossible, for lots of places to reopen. The places that did reopen, the places that didn't reopen, there's no real salient difference in cases and hospitalizations and deaths. It has more to do with strength of unions and political valence of the region, and that is a great tragedy in America. My other thoughts are, this does have implications, I think, for how you think about vaccination, which we'll come to in the next point. Um, the next part of this I want to talk about is uh, the tweet by Marty. Um, Marty Macri um, is a, a very interesting policy uh, 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 policy expert. Uh, he's at Johns Hopkins University. Here's what Marty says. Um, there is a, a hospitalist named James Lim, and James Lim writes this. He said, Marty, uh, my six-year-old had COVID. I swabbed him myself. He was PCR positive in November. And now we can't go on a cruise until two weeks after he's fully vaxxed, so two weeks after dose two. He also potentially cannot even eat in a restaurant in New York City. Where is the science behind that? And before I get flogged for being anti-vax, please look at my tweets. And of course, this is a gentleman who is, as I am and as many doctors are, uh, huge proponents of vaccination. At the same point, we must acknowledge that there are places where the risk-benefit calculus seems to boggle the mind. So you're talking about a six-year-old who we've already cited the German rates. If this is a healthy six-year-old boy, as I, I believe he is, um, the rates are infinitesimally low. They are, you know, two per 100,000 that he would be in the ICU if he were to get COVID and essentially zero risk of death. Now, that's if he hadn't already been affected with SARS-CoV-2. This kid has been infected and recovered from that, which will take those low numbers and make them even lower, even lower. And this kid has already gotten one dose of the vaccine. Uh, but because he's a boy, I think there's some reluctance to give dose two, and they're waiting on that. But he cannot participate in a cruise until then. He cannot go to a restaurant in New York City. And Marty writes, quote, it goes against the data requiring a six-year-old who had COVID to get two vaccine doses embodies the new pandemic of lunacy. I mean, Marty is one of the few people who's got the courage to, I think, call this out as it is. This is not the place where policy people should be putting any of their energies. They are really trying to police um, one in million risks and trying to police that to potentially three quarters of one in million, you know, 0.75 per million or 0.6 per million. Even that's theoretical. It's not even absolute risk reduction. Maybe it's 0.2 per million. But once you start getting in the ballpark of one per million, one per 10 million, you are not in a ballpark where you should be using the power of the state to change these risks. I mean, there are risks that are substantive, risks of one in a thousand. Yes, you can do sort of, I even think, reasonably to do some heavy-handed things to kind of shape those risks. Once you get to one in 10 million, let it go. Have some sense. Have some perspective. You will lose all credibility with the public when you pursue these risks so doggedly. The energy and the apparatus to police the risk might have unintended consequences that dwarf the risk. When you get to risk so low, it's really hard to take them to zero. You can't even expend the energy to do so. Even if there's a consequence of your activity that's unintended, a very small consequence can offset the benefits that you hope to reap from doing this. Um, this is really like trying to grow orange trees in Alaska. It's a foolish, I mean, it's just a foolish thing to do. I don't know, I, no one can say you will never succeed, but it's very unlikely that you will in terms of making the world a better place by doing this. Um, Marty is right. I think as a technical matter, we know the risks are really low. We know natural immunity is very durable. This kid already had one dose. From a policy standpoint, these kinds of exclusionary rules, I'm not very aware of many precedents that ban uh, children from public venues such as restaurants uh, with uh, if they uh, don't have documentation of their identification, by the way, I think many of them don't have great ID, um, as well as a two vaccine status. I don't think it makes sense medically. I think it's preposterous policy. I worry that we're catering. We become so polarized, we've forgotten the central path here, which is that there are very vulnerable people out there who are unvaccinated. They ought to be vaccinated. We're talking about people who are older, 50, 60, 70, 80. They don't have natural immunity and they haven't been vaccinated. They really ought to get vaccinated. They're walking around. It's a ticking time bomb before they're eventually exposed to this virus. It's only a matter of time before they are. There are really only two things you can do to substantively reduce your risk of bad outcomes when you are inevitably 
exposed to the virus. One is vaccination, probably the single best thing you could do. The other thing you could do is tremendous campaign to lose weight and become more fit. I think that will help you. The problem with that recommendation is, of course, we know that recommending somebody lose weight is very difficult and many people are not able to pull it off. But for the people who are motivated, this might be the motivation you need to do it. Um, So I think that would also be a very good thing to attempt. But vaccination has the best data. It has multiple randomized control trials that will lower your risk. Next point, testing. You know, there's a really vocal and passionate group of people who talk about the need to test, 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 test. And the truth is, although it is plausible that testing will bend the pandemic trajectory, will change the future, will make our lives better, um, there are really four things you got to think about when you think about a test. One, you got to think about accuracy. So what is the sensitivity and specificity of tests? What's the false negative and false positive rates? Thankfully, some of the antigen tests have very, very low false positive rates, but unfortunately, they do have some false negative rates, meaning that you might feel ill, test negative, feel reassured that you're in fact negative, but the reality is you are positive, and it's only a matter of time before you test positive or a different test would have found that you're positive. So accuracy is very important, and if you have an inaccurate test, you can actually do more damage. You can have that person who's feeling a little ill, scratchy throat, runny nose, they feel like they're going to get sick, and they're thinking, oh, well, should I go expose and risk my loved one, or should I go to this activity? Um, They test negative. They feel reassured. They go, but actually, they were positive, and if they just trusted their symptoms, they might have not gone. So you're changing the behavior in actually a malicious way with a false negative result. The next thing is fast. The test results have to be fast. Many of these tests, it's just too slow. One day, two day, three days later, if you get the results, a lot can have happened in three days. You may have even forgotten to check the results. I wonder, I'm sure some of these companies have data that they don't want to share as to how many people get tested and then they don't even check their results. That's very bad. So it has to be fast and has to get in your hand. The third thing is, The test result has to change your behavior in a good way. That means if you are really positive and you test positive, you change your behavior, you change your activities, you limit who you see. And if you're positive and and, and you don't have unintended consequences, like if you're actually positive and you test negative, you become more daring. You don't need that. You need good behavioral change. The truth is for many people in America, they just don't have the resources to do too much behavioral change. Yes, they can stay at home, but they're still exposing all their family members to it. They can, the most they can do is try to stay in the one room of their house if they're lucky enough to have individual rooms for people. But a lot of people are struggling in America and they don't have that space. It's not as if any hotel is giving you free accommodations if you were to test positive. If anything, you're going to have to try to find that money. And that's really going to be tough for a lot of people. And the last thing is it has to be consistent. Testing can't just be you know, when you go on a flight to Switzerland or Canada, um, but not for domestic flights and not for most activities. Right now, in the universe of human activities, um, you know, there may be a hundred million, a billion activities that people are doing every day where they come into contact with others. And testing is done in what percent of this? I'd expect much less than 1%. Maybe one-tenth of one percent, one-hundredth of one percent, one-thousandth of one percent of the universe of human activities actually have testing. And what percent of that testing is accurate and fast and changes behavior in a positive way? And it's infinitesimally small. And as long as that's the case, what do you really think you're going to do to the ocean when you spit in it? Are you changing the volume of the ocean? Are you changing the tides? What you're doing is a very tiny, tiny push on this huge, massive human endeavor. And I really think you haven't thought this through, that... It's very likely that what you're doing is a costly activity that makes you feel good that really doesn't change the broader pandemic trajectory. Now, what about individuals? Is there an individual who's benefiting from this testing? Um, I suspect that in the short term, maybe yes, maybe for that activity, but are they really benefiting in the long term? Like by, by some people doing this, are those people likely to never come into contact with this virus? I think that's un, un, unlikely. I think they will eventually come into contact with the virus. Um, are they likely to actually uh, have fewer people around them get really, really sick? I'm not sure. The, the proof is in the pudding, which is if you believe that these aggressive testing strategies really improve clinical outcomes, you can do a cluster randomized control trial in some setting. You pick the setting, and in one arm, these institutions, schools, universities, maybe travel, they are aggressively tested, and in the other arm, they're not. And then you look to see if whether or not there's a difference in uh, bad outcomes from the virus, hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, It's a very tricky trial to pull off. I mean, much more tricky than any other trial. But I think as you work through that power calculation, you will see that it's, 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 even prima facie, quite difficult to do because you'll have to change a lot of people's behavior in a positive way and not have unintended deleterious behavior change. And that is almost impossible to do. I mean, I really think people haven't thought through it enough. I'm going to talk more about this in a future Substack. I'll put a link below to my Substack. Last point, Trevor Noah. 
Trevor Noah, Trevor Noah. Um, he had a funny joke the other day. I saw it. Um, I heard a clip of it. His joke was something like, um, the folks in South Africa who are coming into contract with the Omicron virus, they're saying that it's mostly mild. They haven't seen very severe cases. On the other hand, the guy who makes billions of dollars from Moderna vaccination says you definitely need a new shot. So what am I to think? And so I think his point was that I want to wait until an unconflicted expert suggests I need a booster rather than the guy who's pocketing money from boosters. It's a fair point, my friends. It's a very fair point. And if you look in biomedicine broadly, of course, you want recommendations to use medical products from people who don't stand to personally profit from uh, the use of those products. Of course, that's the case. But yet Trevor Noah was the victim of a dog pile by the media that he was somehow being pejorative towards vaccines. I think we've lost our minds and we actually were doing a great disservice to vaccine confidence by, by picking on Trevor Noah. What do I mean? If you really want the public to believe that you are impartially arguing for vaccines when appropriate, you have to also talk about the places where the appropriateness is less or perhaps questionable. The six-year-old boy who had SARS-CoV-2, who's recovered, who's healthy, who already had one dose. Yes, it's a quite dubious proposition to know whether or not the second dose benefits that six-year-old boy. You have to say that to have credibility to say that you definitely know for sure two, perhaps even three doses are beneficial for that 85-year-old woman who got her two first dose of Pfizer in February of 2020. You need to preserve credibility for that 85-year-old, which means you don't blow your credibility on the six-year-old who had SARS-CoV-2 and recovered and already got one dose, and he's being banned from the New York City restaurant. You have to be able to talk about things with nuance. Trevor Noah was doing just that. He was talking about it with nuance because, of course, you cannot trust the CEO of Moderna to tell you when you need your booster. You need an impartial, unconflicted expert to tell you when you need the booster, if you need the booster. Even better, you yourself should understand why boosters are necessary. Why, why, what evidence would you want to see for a booster? What I want to see is a randomized control trial of people who have had two doses of Moderna, being randomized to the 50 or not 50, and being measured for the outcomes I care about, severe disease, hospitalization, death. Um, I have not yet seen such a study from Moderna. We have the Pfizer study, press released, and we have the summary of it, the summary statistics presented at the Verbac meeting. Um, I haven't yet read the, the paper in my hand. I, I want to see that. But of course, Pfizer and Moderna are different. They're different vaccines with different doses, and the booster studies are different. So we shall see. Trevor Noah was right. He was actually making a point that if anything would have strengthened vaccine confidence if the media were to interpret it correctly. But because the media reflexively criticizes Trevor Noah for that point of view, makes it feel as if he cannot hold that very sensible point of view um, and, and even make a joke about it because let's be honest, he's a comedian. He's not really the person meant to be telling you pause. He's, he's making jokes for a living. Um, but by you crushing him, saying he can't do that, you have, I think, lost a tremendous credibility. Um, we don't know that the media is looking at these issues and calling balls or strikes. They might be much more likely to call strikes. Um, so that's a problem. That's a real problem, actually. And the reaction to him is a bigger problem than anything he ever said for vaccine credibility. Um, and I, 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 I really struggle with it because I'm a strong proponent that vaccination has been a tremendous public health benefit and that medicines, when used correctly, when used based on good evidence, are the best thing we have. Uh, that's what guides my day-to-day -day practice. That's what guides my thinking in biomedicine for all these years. Uh, that is the guide that you, you will find if you ever were to read my two books, Ending Medical Reversal and Malignant. That is the thread that runs through these. So what's the point of this whole thing? The German study, I think, quantifies absolute risks. Of course, we need to treat differently kids with comorbidities and kids without comorbidities. Of course, medicine should accommodate the fact that they have different risks, different needs, and sometimes recommendations will be different. And of course, we should prioritize the vulnerable, older uh, teenage boy with type 1 diabetes who's overweight, who's 16 years old, over the six-year-old who already had SARS-CoV-2 and recovered, who's healthy. Of course, a sensible medical system would prioritize one over the other for who should get the vaccine first. And by doing so, you inherently acknowledge that the risks are different. Of course, if you lump everyone together, then the risk of myocarditis in the entire world is very negligible. But it's different if you're a 12 to 22-year-old boy. Of course, medicine knows you're a 12 to 20 year old boy. They know you're not an 85 year old grandmother. Medicine should use the things we know, use information we know to make better tailored recommendations. We've always done that. It is not discriminatory. Not doing it is silly. It is foolish. It is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You have to take these things into account when you craft policy. Marty was right. That policy is bad. It's a regressive policy. The more we demand young children have IDs, to show that they're proof of vaccination, uh, to go to restaurants, 
it's a very different society. It's a fundamentally different than any sort of vaccine policies we've had around going to school, which are sensible, um, which have been sensible until they get to be questionable, such as the 12 to 15 year old decision in Los Angeles, which right now we're on the cusp of seeing many, many kids in Los Angeles being pushed out of in-person education. They're not, they're, the color of their skin is, is not the same. It's much more likely to be black kids than it is to be white and Asian kids. That is a discriminatory action that Los Angeles is, is poised to take. We have to be really careful with these policies. We've pushed these kids out of school for so long. Going forward, we have to have policies that bring kids into school. Forget SARS-CoV-2 is not the only thing in the world. There are other challenges. Kids going to school is a good. It is a health good and it is a societal good. Don't lose sight of what matters. Keep the absolute risks in your mind. If you cannot tell me the absolute risk of putting your child on the back of your bicycle and biking a mile versus the absolute risk of your child playing with some other kids outdoors with a cloth mask on, if you don't yet know those absolute risks, how do you know which one is safe to do and which one is dangerous? One is riskier than the other, but you need to know the numerical risks. Go look them up. Think about it. Marty, spot on. Testing, I think it's being oversold. Why do I think it's being oversold? For the same reason Trevor Noah's cynical comment. Because the people who are selling it are making money from selling it. And the experts who are touting it often have patents in it or are getting consulting payments from it. It's hard to find a non-conflicted expert. Testing, it could theoretically be great if it could be perfectly accurately, perfectly fast. The information comes in your hand. It changes your behavior instantly in the good direction, but not the bad direction. And it's consistently applied across a society. It's doing none of those things right now. The accuracy is pretty good, I think although the false negatives are sometimes, are, I think, a positive, are a problem. It's not fast enough. It's still a little bit too slow. I suspect there are a lot of people who don't collect their test results. The behavior change is a big open thing because no one's giving you any resources to change your behavior. So I doubt much behavior is changing. And the consistency is the poorest consistency I've ever seen because in the universe of human interactions, you're only doing it in this tiny, tiny place, airports, uh, you know, among wealthy travelers coming to the United States. I mean, you know, or, or other wealthy nations. It's really not going to cut it. Um, I didn't talk about travel bans, but that's I've talked about it on my sub stack. Check that out for Omicron. Trevor Noah, you shouldn't have shamed him. In fact, you should celebrate him. He made a good joke. It was funny, actually. Uh, I, I'm not telling it as well as he told it. It was funny. And there's some truth in it, like all good humor. So on that note, you know what to do. You like this video, like, subscribe, comment, hit that bell below, follow this channel. This is the kind of policy analysis you'll get. Follow my sub stack. I'll put a link below to some of the things I've talked about. You can subscribe to my sub stack. Um, I uh, host the other podcast, Plenary Session. We're starting VPZD podcast. So a lot of, lot of ways you can get this information. So until next time.